Hi, this is Becky Nesbitt. I am the stake permit president in Athens, Georgia stake. This is the audio of a talk that I've given in the Athens, Georgia stake this year about hearing the voice of the spirit and, and teaching children to hear the voice of the spirit. This year in our ward conference presentation to the children, the stake primary was taught to the children about hearing the voice of the spirit. Uh, we want to share a few thoughts about hearing the voice of the spirit and teaching children to do so with you. And to do this, I'm going to tell you about a sheep herding competition that I once attended. In the competition, a dog and master duo must work together to navigate three sheep through a series of obstacles. The dog and master that can successfully get through all the obstacles in the shortest amount of time wins the competition. The trick is that the dog has to do all the work. The human master can only give verbal or whistle commands to the dog. The operating principle of sheep herding is this. The sheep will always move away from the dog. So the direction and speed with which the dog approaches the sheep will determine where the sheep go. And the master has a limited number of commands to use to get the dog to do what it needs it to do um, to successfully herd the sheep through the obstacles. One command is come by, which means that the dog should circle clockwise around the sheep and approach them from the left. This will make the sheep go to the right. Another command is away which tells the dog to circle the sheep in a counterclockwise direction and come at them from the right, thus causing the sheep to go to the left. Lie down means that the dog needs to immediately lay down on the ground so the sheep will relax and stop moving. And the command walk on tells the dog to walk towards the sheep and keep them going in a straight line. Many sheep herders use a whistle in this process because the dog can hear it from farther away, but it also allows a sheep herder that has multiple dogs to create unique whistle commands for each dog so that they can all work together as a team. The obstacles in the competition include things like getting the sheep to go over a bridge, getting them to stand inside a circle painted on the ground, and getting them to enter a small enclosure at the completion of the course. The trickiest part, however, is when the sheep herder and the dog need to separate one of the sheep from the others. This is not an easy feat given that the sheep love to stay together, especially in the presence of a threatening dog. Now I noticed in watching the competition that those pairs that did the very best were the ones in which the dog was attentively listening for the next command and would immediately obey that command when he heard it. Even the slightest delay in the dog's obedience could scatter the sheep or send them running off in the wrong direction. The dog had to be listening because the master was the one who saw the big picture and knew which obstacles needed to be completed and in which order. Now a sheep herding competition is a lot like life. We have a master who is trying to get us through a series of obstacles that we only dimly see and understand. The way to successfully navigate these obstacles is to be attentively listening carefully for our next instructions and to faithful, faithfully obey them as they come. We do so by seeking to hear the voice of the Spirit, a critical skill to develop. In General Conference last April, President Nelson made this provocative statement, statement during his talk about Revelation. He said, quote, our Savior and Redeemer, Jesus Christ, will perform some of his mightiest works between now and when he comes again. We will see miraculous indications that God the Father and his Son, Jesus Christ, preside over this church in majesty and glory. But in the coming days, it will not be possible to survive spiritually without the guiding, directing, comforting, and constant influence of the Holy Ghost." End quote. I want to emphasize that last part again. A prophet of God has told us that it will not be possible for us to survive spiritually without the guidance of the Holy Ghost. And if it is not possible for us as adults to survive spiritually, think of how critical it is for us to be vigilantly teaching our children and young people to hear and heed the voice of the Holy Ghost. Now I've had an advantage in preparing this talk. I've known for almost a year that after ward conferences were done, I would ask the bishops if I could come to speak in each of the units about hearing the voice of the Spirit and teaching children to do so. So as I've been pondering this talk, I've uh, tried to assess how well I felt I was doing at living a life that is guided by the Spirit. So I asked myself the question, what is preventing me from fully living by the Spirit? And I even put that question on my computer screen so that I would see it every time I opened my computer. So in the months, the weeks and months that I spent pondering this question, I've realized some of the barriers that really prevent me from being guided by the Spirit. 
I will tell you about one of those barriers uh, because I think some of you might identify with it. Um, this is that I am a very organized person and I'm a planner. I have my goals and my projects and my to-do lists. Boy, do I have lists. And I'm always working my plan. And I realized that while I will often schedule time to sit and listen for the spirit, there are equally many times when I hang a little do not disturb sign on my mind and my heart that tells the spirit that I am busy getting stuff done on my to-do list and I can't be bothered right then. I did some pondering and asked myself why this is. Why is it that my to-do lists, my goals, and my plans are sometimes more important to me than fully living by the spirit and being open to that voice? And I realized in thinking about it that the purpose of all of these plans, all these goals, all these lists is to get me to a happy and fulfilling life. And I also realized that by not really inviting the spirit to be fully part of that, I was trying to create that life on my own because I didn't trust God to lead me to fulfillment and joy. I've really had to do some soul searching to ask myself if I really trust Father in heaven with my life, if I really trust that he can and will lead me to a life of joy and fulfillment, and if I really believe that perhaps his way of doing so might be faster and easier and better than my own. The answers that I have received are causing me to make some important changes into my life, causing me to really think and ponder and to seek for better ways to live and to learn and to hear the spirit. It has been an incredible life-changing experience for me to ponder this question. So the first thing I wanna do is invite you to take this question home with you and to ponder it. What is preventing you from fully living your life by the spirit? And the reason I give you this question is because we all know if we want to teach children to hear the voice of the Spirit, we must first be doing so ourselves. Sister Sherry Dew, who's a former member of the Relief Society General Presidency, wrote this in a recent book, quote, regular immersion in Holy Writ pays dividends. Studying the scriptures is a key to learning the difference between feeling the, whole, the Spirit and hearing the voice of the Spirit, end quote. I think the distinction that Sister Dew is making here is absolutely critical. There is a difference between feeling the Spirit and hearing the voice of the Spirit. What is that difference? Feeling the Spirit is exactly what the words imply. It is a set of feelings associated with the presence of the Holy Ghost, particularly love, peace, assurance, and comfort. Some examples of feeling the Spirit include feeling upset about something and praying and receiving a feeling of comfort feeling peaceful as we read the scriptures, making a choice and feeling in our hearts that it was the right thing to do, or feeling the Holy Ghost witness to us or confirm to us that something we have heard or read is true. Hearing the voice of the Spirit, on the other hand, pertains to the thoughts, instructions, and nudgings that come to us from the Spirit. When we hear the voice of the Spirit, ideas, knowledge, and understanding come into our minds. And often when we hear the voice of the Spirit, it is giving us specific instruction or a prompting to do something. Hearing the voice of the Spirit often encompasses guidance in the choices that we make. Some examples of hearing the voice of the Spirit include listening to a talk about service and having a name come into our, our head, our mind, of, some, of a person that we should serve, or preparing a lesson for family home evening or for church and feeling very strongly about a certain topic that needs to be shared. Now this distinction is helpful as we work to help children live by the guidance of the Holy Ghost because it gives us two jobs to do. The first is that we need to help children identify when they are feeling the Spirit. And second is to help them to discern the voice of the Spirit, the promptings. To do the first, when the Spirit is present in your home, make sure that you tell your children what you are feeling and that you identify the Spirit for them. For example, if you are discussing an important topic with your children and you feel any of the fruits of the Spirit, peace, love, joy, comfort, then point out, point that out to your children. Tell them that you are feeling those feelings because the Holy Ghost is present. Looking back on my childhood, there were many times that I felt the Spirit early in life, but I did not know or understand that that was what I was feeling, that what I was feeling was the Holy Ghost. And I wish an adult had been there at that time to help me to learn to discern and identify those feelings. You can do that for your children. You can teach them how to identify when they are feeling the Spirit. 
Similarly, we can also help children to learn to hear the voice of the Spirit. One way to do this is to notice when your child makes a good choice and then ask them why they made that choice. If they say something like, they just felt that they should, or it seemed like a good thing to do, odds are it was a nudging or a prompting from the Spirit that made them feel that way. You can identify that for them. So when they say that, you can say the reason it felt like a good thing to do was because that was the Holy Ghost nudging you or prompting you. Just having conversations with your children about feeling and hearing the Spirit will help them to be more attuned to and aware of that still small voice. Now, one of the biggest obstacles that we put between ourselves and having a life that is guided by the Spirit is fear. I told you earlier about one of my fears. But another reason that we are afraid to live by the Spirit is because promptings from the Spirit often push us far outside of our comfort zone. Many of our promptings pertain to things that we should say or do towards another person. These promptings can feel risky because they open us up to the judgments of others. We are terrified of making a mistake, particularly a mistake that will be seen by others. My counselor, Becky Baxter, told the children a personal experience in our ward conference presentation about a time she felt prompted to take food and water to a woman she visit taught. She felt vulnerable and exposed to act upon this prompting because it didn't make sense to her. She didn't understand why the family would need food and particularly why she would need to take drinking water to a family that had running water in their home. She felt silly doing so, but she acted upon those promptings. And it turned out that in this instance, both the food and the drinking water were greatly needed and deeply appreciated. But that vulnerability she felt in acting upon a prompting when she didn't understand the reason behind it was really, really critical because that's a vulnerability we all feel and identify with. Another thing that makes us fear following the Spirit is that we often seek the guidance of the Spirit in what I would call high stakes situations. We seek for help in making big decisions. Should I take this job? Where should I attend college? or in difficult life situations that we really don't wanna mess up. Like how do I overcome this addiction? Or how do I save my struggling marriage? These are what I would call high stakes and high risk situations. The reason it is such is because the outcome matters to us a great deal. And we're often, we often are afraid that there might be one right answer that we have to stumble upon in order to make things work. Because the stakes are high and because the decision is so important to us, we become very emotionally invested in finding what we think is that one right answer. We often become so, so fearful of making a wrong choice that we get paralyzed in our ability to feel and hear the spirit and what it's telling us. We put up barriers that prevent us from hearing because we are afraid that we will not be able to discern what is true and what the spirit's telling us. Or we're afraid um, of getting the answer um, because we're afraid to act upon what, what the answer will be. Now, we do not want our children's and youth's first experiences in seeking to hear the voice of the Spirit to be these high stakes, high risk situations. That's a lot of pressure. Instead, our objective should be to create low risk, low stakes situations for children to practice hearing the voice of the Spirit and acting on those promptings. Elder Wilson in this last general conference in April said this, quote, we need the Holy Ghost as our guide in calm waters so his voice will be unmistakable to us in the fiercest storm, end quote. Now I have found in my own personal life that one of the best ways to create a lower risk situation to hear the Spirit is to pray to know what I can do on behalf of another person. Praying about how to help someone lowers those risks of the situation, it lowers the stakes and reduces the blocks that we put between ourselves and revelation. I think there's a couple reasons for this. One is because the outcome isn't as high stakes as an important life decision for us. And two, I think there's just something special about praying for other people that invites clear, direct, immediate revelation from the Spirit. It's a good way for us to open that channel of communication with the Spirit when we've blocked it by fear. 
It's a great practice to come to when you feel like you're not getting answers about one of your important questions. One way to reopen that channel is to switch your prayers and to pray what you can know, um, pray about what you can do to help someone else. It'll help reopen that channel of communication and reduce those fear barriers that are blocking your ears. Um, when I pray to know how to help others, the promptings often come faster and more clearly because I've reduced those emotional stakes. This builds my confidence that I can hear and follow the, the voice of the Spirit in other things, particularly um, decisions that are higher stakes for me. So my suggestion for you is in order to help build children's confidence in their ability to hear the voice of the Spirit, and in order to reduce their fear of following those promptings is to create opportunities for your children to pray about the service that you give as a family and to receive inspiration about that. Let me give you one example. Um, one thing you could do would be to bake some treats together for family home evening. And then instead of you deciding who to take the treats to, invite your children to go to their bedrooms, kneel on the ground, and pray about who to take those treats to, and then ask them to write down the first name that comes to their minds. Then, together as a family, you take those treats, you walk, go with your children to follow through on that prompting and take the treats to the person that your child felt they should go to. Um, this creates a situation for children to practice hearing the voice of the Spirit while you are walking the path with them. You are there to shepherd them through the whole process, the seeking, the hearing, and acting on the prompting. As you walk this path with your children, it is critical that you have reflective conversations with them after they act on the promptings they receive. This, the reason we need to do this is because we are human beings. And as human beings, we are always looking for validation that a prompting did indeed come from the Spirit. Okay, so in our minds, the formula that we want is this. We want to receive a prompting, and then when we act on it, we want something, some kind of bells or whistles that are going to indicate to us that that was indeed a prompting. So just as, as an example, um, I might feel prompted to call a friend that I, um, that I know. And I call my friend, find out that friend's been struggling. We have a great conversation. And in the conversation, my friend says, you are an answer to my prayers. I really needed this today. And then when I hang up that phone, I know that that was indeed a prompting because of the way she reacted, because of the result that I got. These types of responses confirmed to me that I was acting on a prompting. Um, and this is what we're looking for as human beings. We're looking, we want to understand the reason behind a prompting. Why is it needed? Why do they need food and drinking water? Why did my friend need a call? We're looking for those reasons um, so that we feel that the prompting was validated. It makes us feel more confident. However, there's a problem with this approach because the Lord doesn't always give us the reason for his commands or for the promptings of the Spirit. There are many times when we act on a prompting and the result that we get is not what we expect and isn't a result that necessarily validates the fact that that was a prompting. Sometimes we don't get a tangible result at all. Like you might feel prompted to call a friend. They don't pick up the phone and you just leave a message and you never hear whether or not it meant anything to them or made any difference. And I will add, there are even times when we might act on a prompting from the Holy Ghost and the result might appear to us to be a complete disaster. This has happened to me on more than one occasion. Uh, for example, you might feel prompted to say something to a loved one about their behavior. And instead of them immediately thanking you and deciding to change their life, um, they get mad at you and they might stop talking to you. Does that mean it wasn't a prompting? No. It just means that the result wasn't what we expected or hoped to get to validate the prompting. So the principle is this. We cannot look to the results of our promptings in order to validate that it did indeed come from the Spirit. This is where the distinction between feeling the Holy Ghost and hearing the voice of the Holy Ghost is helpful. Instead of looking for results or reasons to validate a prompting, we should seek for a feeling from the Holy Ghost to validate the prompting, either before or after we act upon it. We can pray for confirmation that our prompting was real um, when we act upon it and we don't get the results that we think um, that we expected to get. 
Um, just a couple additional insights on this that might be helpful. First, sometimes the only reason for a prompting is to give us an opportunity to obey. Sometimes the only reason that the Lord prompts us to do something is so that we'll obey and, op and give him the opportunity to give us greater blessings. Second, I have found that many of those times when I've all followed a prompting of the Spirit and the result looks to me to be a complete disaster, it's actually a carefully orchestrated situation designed for my learning and growth. It's an opportunity for me to go back to Father in Heaven, to share my doubts and concerns with Him, and to ask Him to help me understand what happened. I have found that in those moments, He teaches me, He instructs me, He enlightens my mind. One of the most powerful questions we can ever ask in our prayers is what do I need to learn from this experience? Because when we are ready to be taught, the Lord teaches us. Now, I think you can see why it is so important for you to help your child by going through this reflection process with them as they are practicing and experimenting in learning to hear the voice of the Spirit and act on those promptings. Then your children will know that when the result isn't what they expect, it's not because it wasn't a prompting and it's not because they weren't in tune. It's because, you know, the Lord's plan is, is sometimes different than what we expect. Um, and then your children will know that they can go instead and get on their knees and pray and receive a confirmation, a feeling from the Spirit that will confirm that it was indeed a prompting. This will help your children to grow in their confidence in their ability to hear and live by the voice of the Spirit, even and especially when the results of acting on those promptings aren't what they would expect or desire. You can see how when we, le when we are left to navigate this on our own, when children are left to navigate this on their own, they will begin to doubt themselves and it will compromise their courage to obey the promptings of the Spirit. But if you're walking this path with them, if when um, they act upon a prompting of the Spirit, you're there to talk to them about what they expected to happen and what really did happen and, you know, whether it met their expectations and to, you know, talk to them about how to validate that prompting, that's when their confidence will grow. So, for example, like if you're out with your with your children delivering treats, let's say your child felt prompted to take treats to a neighbor and, you know, maybe that, that old neighbor was really, really cranky. And when they received the treats, maybe they weren't that nice about it and maybe not that grateful. Um, you know, then, you know, your child might interpret that and say, oh, well, I messed up. I wasn't, that wasn't really prompting the spirit because they didn't receive it with gratitude and grace. Um, but you can talk to your child about how, you know, just because somebody doesn't react the way we expect them to doesn't mean it wasn't a prompting. It could have greater impact on that person than they've shown to us. Um, so we must teach children to put their trust in the voice of the Spirit, the actual promptings, nudgings, and commands, rather than the results that they might get uh, or that they hope to get by acting upon those promptings. Finally, one final big, big idea is that one of the most powerful principles associated with receiving revelation, hearing the voice of the Spirit, is taking the time to write it down. Listen to this advice from President Nelson from last April's conference. Quote, Pray in the name of Jesus Christ about your concerns, your fears, your weaknesses, yea, the very longings of your heart. And then listen. Write the thoughts that come to your mind. Record your feelings and follow through with actions that you are prompted to take. As you repeat this process day after day, month after month, year after year, you will grow into the principle of revelation, end quote. I love how he emphasizes here that we should write down our revelation. Writing down revelation and what we receive from the Spirit is important because it helps us to bring, to just draw revelation down from the heaven and bring it into our physical world. It makes us commit to what we hear from the Spirit. Writing it down is a form of commitment. Um, I think sometimes we're reluctant to write it down because we're afraid we didn't hear correctly. And instead, when we do write it down, we're committing to what we heard. Writing it down makes it real. And having a pen in hand and having it poised above a blank page is an invitation to the Lord to give us more revelation. It demonstrates that we are ready to receive. 
Elder Richard G. Scott taught, quote, knowledge carefully recorded enhances the likelihood of your receiving further light, end quote. About a year ago, I expressed to a friend some frustration in trying to get more direction from my life, for my life from the Lord. My friend encouraged me to get a blank journal, and then after I pray and pour out my heart to the Lord, I was to write down what, for, what, what I felt came to me as an answer. I started doing that. It was a little scary at first. I felt some doubt about whether what I was writing really came from the Spirit um, rather than my own mind. But I felt the Spirit powerfully as I would write. And what amazed me even more was that any time I go back and reread those entries, those answers, I feel a powerful confirmation from the Spirit that those words were indeed revelation for me, intended just for me. As you teach your children about the Spirit, encourage them to write down what they hear and what they feel. It will help them to tune into that voice and to practice listening attentively. It will help the revelation in their lives to flow more freely. If you model this behavior for your children, it will be even more powerful. When they see you do this, they will want to do it as well. There are two things I want to emphasize and testify of as I conclude. First, I want to remind you of the statement I quoted from President Nelson at the beginning of this talk, quote, in the coming days, it will not be possible to survive spiritually without the guiding, directing, comforting, and constant influence of the Holy Ghost, end quote. I cannot emphasize to you enough how essential it is that our children learn how to hear the voice of the Spirit. They will not be able to navigate the things that are coming without a connection to the Spirit. And as a parent, what could be more comforting to you than to know that your children know how to heed the promptings of the Holy Ghost, to know that no matter where your children go, no matter what they're doing, no matter who they're with, that they have a connection to the Holy Spirit that can help them, that can protect them, and that if they're faithfully listening for those promptings, um, they will be guided in any circumstances that they fa face. And then finally, in conclusion, I want to bring the talk back to where I started with the sheepdog trial. Remember, those dogs that were the most attentive and who obeyed the most quickly were the ones that were the most successful. And then there's one final command that the master uses for the dogs. At the end of the day, when the work is done or when the competition is over, the master says to the dog, that'll do, indicating that the work is done and the dog can rest. It reminds me so much of a phrase that we often hear in the scriptures, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Anytime you make an effort to teach your children about the Holy Ghost, listen for that voice saying, well done. All of your efforts to live by the Spirit, well done. In everything that you do, in all of your efforts to live by revelation and to invite it into your life, well done. The Lord is pleased with you for trying. He is pleased with you for your desires. Do not give up. Do not get discouraged because it is sometimes difficult to discern that voice. Just keep practicing. Keep at it. And uh, I encourage and exhort you to reach out to a child in your life and help them to learn how to hear and heed the voice of the Holy Ghost. And I say this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.